Good morning, and welcome to the MSC Industrial Supply 2021 First Quarter Conference Call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to John Corona, Vice President of Investor Relations and Treasurer. Please go ahead. Thank you, Jason, and good morning, everyone. Eric Gershwin, our Chief Executive Officer, and Kristen Actus Grande, our Chief Financial Officer, are both on the call with me today. As on our last call, we are all remote, so bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties. During today's call, we will refer to various financial and management data in the presentation slides that accompany our comments, as well as our operational statistics, both of which can be found on the Investor Relations section of our website. <clears throat> Let me reference our Safe Harbor Statement under the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, a summary of which is on slide two of the accompanying presentation. Our comments on this call, as well as the supplemental information we are providing on the website, contain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the U.S. securities laws, including statements about the impact of COVID-19 on our business operations, results of operations and financial condition, expected future results, expected benefits from our investment in strategic plans and other initiatives, and expected future growth and profitability. These forward-looking statements involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those anticipated by these statements. Information about these risks is noted in our earnings press release and the risk factors in the MD&A sections of our latest annual report on Form 10-K filed with the SEC, as well as in other SEC filings. These risk factors include our comments on the potential impact of COVID-19. These forward-looking statements are based on our current expectations, and the company assumes no obligation to update these statements. Investors are cautioned not to place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements. In addition, during this call, we may refer to certain adjusted financial results, which are non-GAAP measures. Please refer to the GAAP versus non-GAAP reconciliations in our presentation, which contain the reconciliation of the adjusted financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures. I'll now turn the call over to Eric. Thank you, John, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'll begin by wishing each of you a happy, a healthy, and especially a safe new year. I'll start the call this morning with some perspective on our journey and our recent progress. I'll then review first quarter results and take a deeper dive into our growth initiatives. From there, Kristen will review the financials in more detail and provide color on our structural cost program. I'll then wrap up before we open up the line for questions. As we enter the middle of fiscal 2021, momentum on our mission critical initiative is building. This is evidenced in part by improving numbers, but more importantly, by progress against our key initiatives and by the increasing pace with which we're operating the business. As a reminder, several years ago, we decided to reposition MSC from a spot by supplier to a mission critical partner. We captured this in our new brand promise, built to make you better. And we did so in order to secure the next decade plus of MSC's success and to deepen the moat around our business. Since that time, we have recreated MSC's value proposition, remodeled our supply chain with an elevated presence on the plant floor, reshaped MSC's sales force, built new platforms for growth such as CCSG, and we've accelerated the pace of innovation with advancements like MSC Milmax. We've built new digital capabilities like e-commerce to improve customer retention and loyalty, and a new pricing function to improve price execution and realization. And finally, we've taken steps to create a more agile culture in order to drive change faster. On our last call, we outlined Mission Critical, or our pathway to translate these changes into improved performance. 
we shared two three-year targets, and those were accelerated market share capture and improving ROIC. We shared five growth levers that will deliver at least 400 basis points of outgrowth above IP by our fiscal 2023. We also shared a structural cost initiative that would yield at least 200 basis points in operating expense to sales ratio improvements by fiscal 2023, powering ROIC back into the high teens during that time. While we're encouraged by progress, we have our sights set high and we're just getting started. We're making inroads on the five growth levers and we're moving aggressively on the structural cost front to achieve our one-year and three-year targets with a robust project pipeline and a steady drumbeat of changes being implemented across the company. Looking outside of our company, all of this is happening against the backdrop that remains challenging but is showing some positive indicators. The good news on the vaccine front and the recently passed stimulus package will likely improve the outlook over the coming quarters. I'll now turn to our fiscal first quarter financial results, which you can see on slide four. Overall sales were down 6.3%, and gross margin was down 30 basis points versus the prior year period. Our operating margin on a gap basis was 7% and was significantly influenced by a non-recurring asset impairment charge which I'll describe in greater detail shortly. As you can see on slide five, excluding this impairment charge and adjustments related to severance and costs associated with mission critical, our adjusted operating margin was 11.0%, down 30 basis points from the prior year, despite lower sales and supported by mission critical. All of this resulted in earnings per share of 69 cents for the quarter, or $1.10 on an adjusted basis. We're seeing continued sequential improvement in our sales levels. Most notably, our non-safety and non-janitorial product lines improved through the quarter and declined low double digits. Sales of safety and janitorial products anchored by our PPE program continued growing at over 20% for the quarter. The improving trends extended into December with total company sales growth estimated at 2.4%. While aided by some large PPE orders, December is nonetheless encouraging as the rest of the business, excluding safety and janitorial, was down in the low single digits year over year. Looking at our performance by customer type, Government sales continue to grow significantly year over year due to the surge in large safety and janitorial orders. National accounts de declined in the low teens, while our core customers declined low double digits, and CCSG was down mid-single digits. As you can see on slide six, industrial production remained in the negative single digits range, but did improve over the prior quarter. Most manufacturing end markets behaved consistent with this trend, although metalworking-centric end markets did continue to lag the broader IP index. More importantly, we have seen the gap between IP and our growth rate begin to compress as expected. We plan to build on that momentum, and as a reminder, we target exiting fiscal 2021 with at least the 200 basis point positive gap above IP for our fourth quarter. I'll now turn to our growth initiatives. On the last call, I outlined five levers that will drive our improved growth over the next three years. And those are metalworking, solutions, selling our portfolio, digital, and diversified end markets. Today, I'll discuss and focus on a couple of them. First, 
metalworking. We're investing heavily in our core business in order to widen our lead. One way we do so is by capturing new customers from local distributors who are under tremendous pressure in the current environment. We track our funnel of opportunities and win rate by market, and both are progressing according to plan. We expect that prog progress to build as the locals come under more and more pressure with each passing month. MSC Milmax is aiding our efforts to capture market share. Milling is one of the most significant cutting tool applications. Cutting tools represent roughly 30 to 40 percent of the 12 to 15 billion dollar metalworking market. MSC Milmax not only provides opportunities to capture share within cutting tools, but it opens up access to our customers' broader MRO purchases, which are multiple times the size of their cutting tool spend. We're seeing strong early reception to the new technology. Our funnel of opportunities is building quickly and is starting to produce new wins. As we do with vending, we're offering MSC Milmax as a service in exchange for incremental share of wallet. The second initiative I'll feature is government, which is right now our largest diversification play. We've been working hard over the past two years to turn our government business from an underperformer to an outperformer. And while we're benefiting from a PPE tailwind, we are nonetheless pleased with our progress in the fiscal first quarter as the business grew over 35%. Beyond the current momentum, we're investing in this area to build for the future, including adding hunter roles dedicated to creating new opportunities for us. Third, I'll highlight our Salesforce build-out. Growing and reshaping our Salesforce is an important enabler that powers each of the five initiatives. In recent years, we've taken sales headcount down in order to reshape the sales force consistent with our new strategy. For the first time in several years, we're now poised to expand the sales force. We had a delay due to the pandemic, but we've now restarted those efforts. In our fiscal first quarter, we increased our sales headcount by 50, including roles such as business development or hunting, metalworking specialists, and government. This effort has been aided by the redesign and outsourcing of our talent acquisition function, which was one of the mission critical projects that Kristen mentioned on the last call. We are hiring faster and at a lower cost. Before turning things over to Kristen, I'll now discuss our PPE program and the related impairment charge for the nitro gloves. From the outset of the pandemic, we have worked hard to source critical PPE supplies to support our customers in need and to keep the front lines of industry and government workers safe. Despite the widespread scarcity of certain products and well-documented supply chain issues, we've been successful in this effort across a wide range of items. Nitro gloves have proven to be more challenging. Over the past several months, a number of our large customers approached us in dire need of this scarce product. Our normal channels of supply could not produce sufficient quantities as the Nitro Glove global supply chain is under extreme pressure right now. As a result, in September, our team turned to new sources of supply. We used prepayments to secure priority status, which has been a standard market practice through the pandemic and has been an effective tool for us in securing scarce product during this time. As of today, we've not yet received the gloves, and in light of the growing uncertainty over our ability to secure deliveries, we recorded an impairment charge for the full amount of the prepayments. We are, of course, pursuing all possible paths to either secure the gloves or a refund of our prepayments. Pulling back from this specific issue, we're quite pleased with our PPE program, which has consisted of hundreds of global supply transactions, leading to substantial revenues 
and most importantly, the ability to keep our customers safe. I'll now pass it over to Krista. Thank you, Eric. Let me start with a review of our fiscal first quarter, and then I'll update you on the progress of our mission critical initiatives. For reference, on slide four of the presentation, you'll see key metrics for the first quarter on a reported basis. Slide five reflects the adjusted results, which will be my main focus this morning. Our first quarter sales were 772 million, or 12.5 million on an average daily sales basis, both a decline of 6.3% versus the same quarter last year. Moving to gross margins, our first quarter gross margin was 41.9% a decline of 30 basis points compared to the first quarter of last year. Sequentially, gross margin improved 30 basis points compared to fourth quarter 2020, despite the headwind from some large PPE sales that we mentioned on our last call. We continue to see solid performance due to the traction of our initiatives. Our execution on both the pricing and purchasing fronts has been strong, with solid realization from our annual price increase, as well as improvements to our supplier programs. December gross margins continued the trend of solid execution on the price and cost fronts. We could, however, see increased headwinds in gross margins due to PPE-related SKUs over the next couple of quarters. Total operating expenses in the first quarter were $243 million, or 31.4% of sales, versus $257 million, or 31.2% of sales in the prior year. This includes about $4 million of costs related to severance and the review of our operating model, both related to mission critical. The severance made up about one-third of that amount. Excluding these costs, operating expenses as a percent of sales were 30.9%. In the prior year, excluding $2.6 million of costs related to severance, operating expenses were also 30.9% of sales. We were able to keep the adjusted OPEX to sales ratio flat despite the decline in sales as our mission critical initiatives continue to deliver savings. I'll go into more details on the progress of our mission critical initiatives in a minute. Including the asset impairment charge that Eric mentioned earlier, all of this resulted in gap operating margin of 7% compared to 11% in the same period last year. Excluding the impairment charge, severance and other related costs, our adjusted margin was 11% versus an adjusted 11.3% in the prior year. Gap earnings per share were 69 cents, adjusted for the impairment charge as well as severance and other related costs, adjusted earnings per share were $1.10. Turning to the balance sheet and moving ahead to slide seven, we achieved free cash flow of 95 million in the first quarter as compared to 72 million in the prior year. This improvement was driven by our accounts payable management and the deferral of payroll taxes under the CARES Act. As of the end of fiscal Q1, we were carrying 521 million of inventory, down 22 million from last quarter. Roughly 60 million of that is related to PPE products and over half of that is specific to disposable masks. This is ample supply should the virus surge continue. During the quarter, we continued to manage our liquidity very closely, and we paid down $130 million of our revolving credit facility in Q1. Our total debt as of the end of the first quarter was $490 million, comprised primarily of a $120 million balance on our revolving credit facility, $20 million of short-term fixed-rate borrowings, and $345 million of long-term fixed-rate borrowings. Cash and cash equivalents were $53 million, resulting in net debt of $437 million at the end of the quarter. Since then, in December, we paid a special dividend of approximately $195 million, which we funded primarily from our revolver. The special dividend reflects our longstanding commitment to returning capital to our shareholders as part of our balanced capital allocation philosophy while maintaining a conservative balance sheet. Before I turn it back to Eric, let me provide an update on our mission-critical productivity goals. On slide eight, you can see our original program goals of 90 to 100 million of cost takeout through fiscal 2023, and that is versus fiscal 2019. On our last call, we shared that we had taken out 20 million of cost in fiscal 2020, and that our goal for fiscal 21 was to take out another 25 million to achieve cumulative savings of 45 million by the end of fiscal 21. I'm pleased to report that we achieved an additional 8 million of savings in the first quarter, 
bringing our cumulative savings to $28 million against our goal of $45 million by the end of this year. This is gross savings and does not reflect investments of roughly $2 to $3 million in the first quarter and $15 million expected in fiscal 21. While one quarter does not make a year and we did capitalize on some low-hanging fruit, I'm encouraged by our fast start to the year and our continued momentum in executing our mission-critical productivity programs. In addition to some of the initiatives I mentioned last quarter, which are proceeding as planned, we also have signed an agreement to sell our Melville, New York facility. This 170,000 square foot facility on 17 acres served as one of our co-headquarters. We will be relocating late this spring to a smaller 26,000 square foot space nearby, which will accommodate our new hybrid working model. Once the sale of our current location is complete, we will save roughly $3 million annually in operating expenses we will continue to review our real estate footprint for additional opportunities. And I'll now turn it back to Eric. Thank you, Kristen. Last quarter, we outlined our mission critical initiative that's aimed at turning the hard work we've performed over the past several years into improved financial performance. Our company's sites are firmly set on two goals referenced on slide 12 to be achieved by the end of our fiscal 23. First, growing at least 400 basis points above IP, and second, returning ROIC back into the high teens. We have five growth initiatives powering our market share aspirations, and we are executing significant structural cost reductions that we expect to improve operating expenses as a percentage of sales by at least 200 basis points. As we move into the middle of our fiscal year, we're encouraged by the momentum that's building inside the company. This is evidenced by improving numbers and by improving execution of the projects behind them. Most significantly, there's an energy building inside the four walls of MSC, and with each passing quarter, we expect that energy to grow. We will not rest until we've achieved our mission of being the best industrial distributor in the world, as measured by all four of our stakeholders. Thank you, and we'll now open up the line for questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one, on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. The first question is from David Mancy from Baird. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning and Happy New Year, everyone. Hi, Dave. Happy New Year. Uh, Hi, Dave. Yeah. Hi. So um, first question, kind of big picture. Could you outline the role of technology in the mission critical effort? I mean, if, if you're cutting costs and you hope to maintain or improve the productivity and, and customer service of MSC, uh, how, how are you doing that? Can you give us a couple of examples? Yeah, Dave, I, I think uh, it, it's so good question. And what I would say is just the way on the growth side, we described Salesforce um, as an enabler, you know, the expansion of the Salesforce as something that powers or enables each of the five initiatives. You know, technology is underpinning everything we're doing. And that's, that's on the cost side. It's on the growth side. So on the growth side, I'll, and I'll get to your question on costs, on the growth side, heavy investment into digital, as we had talked about, is one of the five levers. Heavy investment into pricing analytics that we're beginning to see translate in the form of improved price realization on the gross margin line. And then, of course, yes, uh, heavy emphasis on using technology um, to power some of the structural cost initiatives. And I think what's most significant there is the cost takeout here. This is not an exercise of just stripping cost out of the business. This is an exercise in improving how we do things. So, you know, a perfect example of that is what Kristen just mentioned with, with our move in Melville. Yes, it was a downsizing of the building, but really what we're doing is rethinking the way we work and using technology to do it. So it's moving to a hybrid work model. Um, and obviously for all of us, uh, technology has been at the core of that. And, you know, not only does that open up productivity gains, it, it allows us to shrink real estate footprint um, it allows us to rethink travel and how often we need to get together, um, but, but it opens up talent pools in new locations that were not wed to 
uh, you know, Melville, for instance, that we can recruit, especially in certain functions in other areas. So that would be an example, Dave. But I think what you'd see if you go project by project um, across the three big buckets, sales and service, supply chain, and G&A, is technology is underpinning a lot of it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then just to clarify one thing, on slide number five, where you say that non-safety sales were down year to year but improved sequentially each month, when you say improved, are you talking about dollars there? Is that average daily sales growth rates? What is the improvement you're referring to? That would be improvement in our average daily sales rates, Dave. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. Our next question is from John Inch from Gordon Haskett. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. Hi, John. Happy New Year. Thank you. Um, so let me start, Eric and Kristen. Raw material costs have been uh, going up. Have you seen that reflected in the prices of your purchased products? And how, Eric, are you thinking about the annual price increase? And maybe you could talk about, uh, you know, just supplier pricing actions and trends in general. John, so you're right. Um, what you're pointing out is something we have, our sourcing folks have their, their eyes on closely, particularly as it relates to metals. Um, what I would tell you is, to date, it's been a little early um, to see it translate. As, as, as you know, in following us for a while, one of the real triggers for us is seeing the commodities movements translate into supplier, um, uh, supplier list increases, which um, have, have not yet come in earnest. We do, we do expect, though, that that's going to build should the inflation sustain. Um, as of now, our thinking is we would expect to implement a price increase um, you know, timing-wise, it's still a little early, but figure roughly end of Q2, beginning of Q3 is kind of what we're thinking now. And, John, the only other thing I'll point out is I think if you, if you look at our growth decomposition, you'll see we're, we're seeing improved price realization. Uh, the most recent increase we took was back over the summer. It was in the 1% range, so it was pretty modest given the low inflation at the time. So we're encouraged. We've invested a lot into price um, you know, sort of price execution, price analytics, and we think we're starting to see that in the form of improved realization. So just based on your answer, it's too soon to tell if the rising raw material costs are going to translate into higher product costs. Like, what, what's traditionally the lag? And, and are your competitors raising prices yet, or are they also kind of waiting and seeing? So g generally there is a lag, and it will depend on how – it always, you know, it's, it's, it's usually a several-month lag. It depends on – exactly when depends yep. on how fast they snap back. And, of course, I think it would have to be sustained for a bit of time before our manufacturers um, pass it along. We, we, we watch pricing carefully. I would say to date we've not seen a lot of movement. But history would suggest that if what we're seeing now in the inflation does hold, that it would yield uh, increases coming from our suppliers. And it's a matter of time. And, no, that makes sense. And then just as a follow-up question, Eric, um, so the 400 basis points of targeted market outgrowth, does your plan provide for a more granular breakdown, say, by targeted industry? So some aspects, government might be more than 400, some less. And if, if so, I'm assuming that's the case. Could you give us any details uh, to kind of square up the 400 target? Yeah, so it, look, in, in, inside the company, John, we have the 400 broken out a few ways. Certainly by customer type, we have a look uh, we also have a look by product and service category, and we have another look that's, you know, literally down to the geography, the zip code sort of level um, by initiative of our five big levers. So we have multiple cuts at it. Uh, certainly, um, you, you know, there's going to be industries that grow faster than others. Uh, what I would say is a couple things. One is you're going to see us, it, 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 it's, for us, it's a balance. On the one hand, you're going to see us continue to invest in our core. Our core is metalworking, and metalworking gets sold into those heavy, um, you know, heavy manufacturing sectors that have been hit pretty hard. So if you look at the IP numbers, they've been lagging. Those heavy metalworking-centric end markets have been lagging. At some point, when there's a, recover, a, a, a real recovery, um, those will snap back, and we think we'll benefit in an outsized way by staying focused on that segment. Um, the second piece would be, you know, the balance is sort of the fifth lever, if you will, is the diversified and markets, and, and, and the biggest focus for us right now is, is the one you touched on, John, government. Uh, certainly, um, you know, we're encouraged by momentum there. That would be one that we would expect to outpace the 400 for sure. 
uh, given you know its relative size in our portfolio, size of market, and the level of uh, investment we're putting there. Yeah, you mentioned metalworking in the last call, Eric, as a continued focus. So does metalworking grow faster than 400, or is it kind of around the 400, based on your plan? You know, look, I, th I think it'll move around, John, and obviously it'll be a function of how we execute, how much share we capture. I think, you know, the way we look at it is given our relative, um, our relative size in metalworking and market share that we have, if we were growing at 400 basis points above IP in metalworking, that would be a pretty good result and would allow us to widen the lead given the size of the base we're starting with. Makes sense. Thank you. Thanks, John. Our next question comes from Hamza Mazari from Jefferies. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Uh, Happy New Year. Um, hey, Hamza. Hey, uh, so, so my question is just around the, uh, uh, the reacceleration of market share. And you mentioned there's a new energy building inside the company. You know, maybe you could talk about sort of, you know, how is this restructuring different from a cultural buy-in perspective? Um, and then, and then how, how conservative uh, are the numbers you've put out there, the 400 basis points, the ROIC sort of mid-teens? Um, how, how, how do we think about those two items? Hamza, so let me, let me start with the, the, the energy, you know, the, the question around the energy, and there is. I mean, if you're inside the company, and, and, and right now, by large measure, that's inside it virtually, um, y y you would feel a change. Um, and, and, and what I would say is I'd go back to say, look, if you, if you go back over the life of this company, or particularly our life as a public company, we're going on 25 years now, the DNA of this company is a growth company and one that always stretched and saw itself having goals that were much bigger than where it was at the time. And look, over the past few years, we've been through a lot of changes. We're coming out the other side of the changes and are reconnecting with that legacy and the idea of thinking big and setting stretch goals. I think that's one of the sort of the biggest things is a reconnection with that idea and a leadership team that's embracing it, that's embracing the idea of stretching for management. And, you know, I think that's beginning to trick its way through the organization. Um, you know, so to your point about how conservative are the goals, um, look, as, as you could imagine, um, you know, like, like most things inside the company, we, we are stretching and, you know, for any goal that we're talking to you about, you could imagine that uh, for the group inside of sales, is there a higher aspiration? Sure. For the group on, that's focusing on the cost side by area, is there a higher aspiration? Sure. Uh, because we are trying to build the mentality into the company of stretch and think big. Got it. Um, and then just on the, on the gross uh, cost savings target of 90 to 100 million, do, 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 do you have a sense of how big the reinvestment uh, you're thinking into growth will, will look like and, and, and where you're going to reinvest? I know you talked about sort of rebuilding the sales force and hunters, uh, uh, you know, 50, I think you said, as a number. Uh, but, but just order a magnitude, uh, how much of those gross savings, you know, would be reinvested and is it going to be all in sales or are there other areas? Yeah, so for this year, uh, we're looking at a $15 million reinvestment. That would be for fiscal 21. Uh, for 22 and 23, uh, you can definitely look for that annual number to step down. Um, we're going to continue to invest. You know, I, I don't think we've given a specific range for it, but I'd say you could probably look for seven, seven, eight million of, of reinvestment in 22 and 23. That's always changing, though, as we continue to add more to the pipeline, look at the prioritization of when things come online. Um, as far as where the investment goes, you know, we're focused on the three areas, cost out in G&A, supply chain and sales and service. It's, it's an investment really underpinning all three. Um, this year is a bit more focused on the sales and uh, service areas, um, particularly with the digital initiative ramping up very quickly, but you're going to see investment across the board. As Eric mentioned, a lot of the stuff we're looking at on the cost side is really transformative too and requires investment. Um, so it would be across the board, uh, nearer term, a bit more weighted to sales and service. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. The next question is from Kevin Marek from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Kevin. Good morning. 
Um, can you just update us on what happened in, in sales in terms of safety versus non-safety performance? Like how did it trend by month through the quarter and then obviously, you know, through December? Uh, yeah, sure. And we can get your specific numbers. I mean, what I'll do, Kevin, is just give you sort of the general uh, picture as to what's going on is, you know, it's, it's consistent with what we're seeing in the indices. Like IP, we, we, we are seeing a sequential build in the performance, particularly of the base business, and by base I mean non-safety, non-janitorial. So if you look at safety and janitorial, which is um, a great proxy for our PPE program, um, through the first quarter that was growing in the low 20s, uh, December stepped up to high 20s, close to 30. Um, but I think the real story is what's been happening in the non-safety slash janitorial, you know, the, other, the, 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 the core of the business, which has been a steady climb up. So, you know, you go back to the teeth of the pandemic, you know, we were talking down, I believe it was mid-20s, I mean, you know, in, in the depths of this thing. And we've been on sort of a gradual, a gradual climb up. And then, you know, obviously, look, we got a nice pleasant surprise in, in, in December uh, where the all other, the base business was down low single digits. So, um, you know, w one month does not a trend make. Um, it was an encouraging sign. We got some benefit of some some CARES Act spending as, as, as that was expiring, but um, it's been a steady climb up in the base business. Got it. Thank you. And then as a follow-up, um, you know, is there any gross margin implication that you would call out from the trends you've seen in December as far as 2Q expectations are concerned? You know, I think typical seasonality maybe doesn't call for much of a change, Q over Q. Yeah, let me, let me touch on uh, gross margin, and I'll, I'll put it back in the context of kind of the guidance we gave last quarter around the operating margin framework. Uh, so what we, what we told you last quarter on gross margin uh, range, thinking about the year, is you can expect this to be flat to maybe down 50 bips. The biggest variable there is really uh, mix driven by the PPE headwinds. So, so since then, we've seen a couple of things happen. Um, one, our price and cost execution has been really strong, like we alluded to uh, for December. I'd say it's as good or better than we had envisioned. Um, two, we see a higher chance of larger PPE headwinds for a quarter or two. And, and what's behind that is, one, we've got a large inventory position on masks. You know, the virus is surging. We may end up selling through a lot of those. Um, at the same time, it's no surprise to share that mass pricing has come down over the past uh, couple of quarters. But really, given the strong price cost performance, it will still likely fall within that flat to down 50 bips range, even with the larger PPE headwind. I think if the PPE headwind were to become really large, it's possible we could stray outside that, that down 50 bips range. If that happened, I think what you'd see us do is enact countermeasures, whether it's you know on the gross margin line or, or elsewhere on the P&L to mitigate that risk as much as possible, but really trying to still protect that investments that are going to drive the growth both in 21 and beyond. Um, you know, regardless of what happens with PPE, it is a temporary headwind. I think in a couple of quarters, the underlying price cost dynamic, that's what we're most focused on, and we're really pleased with what we see there. Um, you know, and more broadly, we're still very committed to the two overall mission critical targets uh, around the market uh, growth capture and ROIC improvement. Got it. Understood. Thank you. Happy New Year again. Happy New Year. The next question is from Michael McGinn from Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hey, morning, everybody. Great quarter. Good morning. Hey, thanks, Mike. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, so I wanted to touch on your annual margin framework. Historically, your financials have seen a slow start given the first half seasonality of the business, um, but you were able to meet the low end of your full year framework on a mid-high single-digit revenue decline. So assuming mix is normalizing and price building momentum to the benefit of your gross margin, I was just curious, what are your embedded assumptions for SG&A in terms of cost out opportunity and maybe what would what factors would push that to the high end of the annual framework? Sure, sure. So, so drilling in a bit on SG&A in terms of the op margin framework um, that we laid out last quarter, um, our thinking on on the operating expenses still holds. Really, if you if you end up seeing revenue flat to slightly down, you can look for the opex expense to be slightly down. 
uh, as well, um, and we are on target for that still. Uh, if, you, if you think about kind of what would drive us to the upper end of the overall op margin framework, uh, I'd say you could have one potential where you're looking at potentially overdriving the productivity programs. Um, you know, we're always looking to be more aggressive on, on things in that department. On the gross margin side, um, again, we are seeing strong underlying price and cost performance. I'm not sure that I would say the, the mix headwind is behind us yet because we still do have PPE volume uh, moving through, and, 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 you know, especially in the next couple quarters, um, it's still likely that PPE mix could be a headwind. Um, but I'd say the, the um, operating expenses largely still in line with the framework. You know, gross margin, we feel confident we're in that flat down 50 bips range. So if you saw anything advantageous against either of those, those could tick us up to the, the upper end of the range. Okay, I appreciate that. And then um, you mentioned some nice trends within milling and the MillMax initiative you have. Um, I'm assuming that's catering to your core customer as well, some government. Can you remind us what milling and maybe CCSG combined as a percent of your revenue is? So let me, let me talk a little bit, and Mike, what I'll do is maybe frame for you Milmax, um, which is really, you're right, Mil, Milmax is powering the core business. Um, the interesting dynamic, though, is it's powering it in the metalworking category, but we see an opportunity to power sort of other ancillary MRO products within the heavy manufacturing sector. So let me explain a little bit. So, you know, metalworking in the U.S., we size at 12 to 15 billion, and it fluctuates based upon what's happening in the market. You can imagine right now with spending being down, the economy being soft, it's at the lower end of that. Um, cutting tools as a whole represents 30 to 40 percent of metalworking. Um, that's been the company's bread and butter for a long time. Within the cutting tool universe, Milling is one of the biggest ap um, applications within Cutting Tool. That's where MSC Milmax is designed to show productivity. And look, the, the results in terms of improving customer throughput productivity have been really, really encouraging. Um, so, you know, frame there, we, we believe there's, you know, roughly around 45,000 locations, customer locations in the U.S. Um, that would be candidates for MSC Milmax. And those are, that's basically the universe of, you know, where we see the right fit of heavy manufacturing that's doing milling applications. The opportunity for us is to go in there, and it's not just, it's to improve the customer's productivity. And then as we described, we're really providing a service, and then in exchange for the service, we're asking for incremental market share capture. In many cases so far, and obviously it's still very early, uh, what we're seeing, though, is the market share capture may or may not happen in cutting tools. It may happen in the customer's ancillary spend. So if you go into a typical manufacturing operation, uh, generally for every dollar of cutting tools they're spending, they're going to spend some multiple of that on MRO purchases, and sort of that's the bigger opportunity for us. And, and all of this, obviously, is to power the 400 basis point outperformance that we're gearing ourselves towards. Okay, and if I if I could dig into that a little further, can you maybe touch upon why Milmax is important to have in the hands of a distributor versus maybe an OEM? Because my perception is you're going in, you're providing these services, and you're finding the best and right solution. So how does that? work with your maybe supplier relationships and you're able to provide, you know, the best product that you know works versus favoring one or, or another, you know, a product where an OEM might. Yeah, Mike, so that, that's, it's a great question. And, and look, I, I think I, I really, as much as I love the Milmax technology and, and about what it's doing, I think we are perfectly positioned to be the one to bring this to market for a couple of reasons. One is the technology by itself is a piece to the puzzle. The end here is about finding productivity and, and helping customers improve throughput, reduce wasted materials, et cetera. To do that, you need to tech, this technology is, is, is unique, but by itself, it's not enough. You actually need a technical person alongside to interpret the data, somebody who understands machining and metalworking, which you know, obviously we've, we've got the largest national um, footprint of, of, of metalworking tech specialists in our field and in our care, customer care centers. 
And then on top of that, Mike, and this gets to your question about the suppliers. Look, suppliers are our suppliers and the manufacturer could do this. Here's the challenge they face. Ultimately, what this tool does is it brings objectivity, and it removes brand preference because it's a, it moves it to performance. And so um, the, the benefit that a customer has by doing business with MSC is we're going to give them the right – we're going to use interpret the data, and then we're going to give them the right answer to their problem. And, the, you know, the nice thing there is MSC has the broadest and deepest metalworking portfolio in the industry. So I, I think all three of those components together – or what's needed to really maximize value to this thing. And I think we're, you know, in a fortunate position to have all three. Thank you. Appreciate the time. I'll, I'll pass it along. The next question is from Adam Ullman from Cleveland Research. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Good morning. Happy New Year to you all. Good morning, and Happy Adam. New Year. Yeah, I was wondering if we could start with um, a discussion about your hiring plan for the sales force for the rest of the year. I'm, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to dimension um, just how many folks you um, are looking to add to the sales force and then um, – or, or maybe more of this reinvestment, the um, $15 million for the year is – should I be thinking of that as um, going forward as being more digital investments and not headcount related? So, so Adam, I'll, I'll start. You know, look, we, we, let me start with the bigger, the, the, the bigger question on investments, you know, growth investments. We are really focused on this three-year, if I haven't said it enough, the 400 basis points plus and building momentum along the way. We, we've got five growth levers that we believe all five are critical to hitting the 400 basis points plus, and then underpinning that is the Salesforce expansion, which I'll get to. But, again, those five, metalworking, solutions, selling the full portfolio, digital, and diversified segments, which right now is government. You're going to see investment, where the growth investment's going, it's going directly into those five, and then into the sales force that's going to power those five. Um, in terms of the sales force particularly, look, we, we, we've been, it's been a few years now since we've expanded the sales force. Um, you know, Adam, you, you've been following our story for a while. We have been through this whole repositioning of the business and, and we needed to reshape the sales force in order to bring this thing to life. And what that meant was over the last couple of years under um, Eddie's watch, we've, we, we've taken headcount down because what we, we, we found was that we were over-assorted in, in, in certain roles, i.e. in farmers, did not have enough in hunters and some other key roles in metalworking that we're now throttling up. So we're reshaping the sales force. Um, you saw us add 50 in the first quarter. Look, if, 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 if we can continue hiring the right people as we're doing, um, we could see that continue at sort of that rate and pace uh, for the balance of plus or minus for the balance of the fiscal. You know, we, we'd like to get it where we're back to 2019 levels uh, on what we publish in our sales and service stats by the end of the fiscal. And look, obviously the idea is we're going to be funding that growth investment. You know, that's a headcount addition in the sales force. We're going to be funding that through the productivity work that, um, that Kristen described. Okay, great. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and then secondly, Christian, could you provide the magnitude of the PPE headwind to gross margin this quarter within that 30 basis point decline? And, and just given what you're seeing so far here in December um, with the, the surge in PPE orders, um, did I hear you correctly say that a similar headwind in the second quarter, or is that still, still up in the air? Yeah, I'd say second quarter is likely to be higher. Um, we didn't, we're, we're not seeing it yet in December, but based on uh, what we think is going to happen with uh, inventory moving out the door, we do see a larger PPE headwind for Q2, probably also for Q3. And then uh, I think I heard you mention uh, something in there on, on Q1. Um, we did see some PPE mix headwind in Q1. That was uh, really driven by some large orders that went out the door. Um, which is a, a similar um, reason that we would expect to see uh, increased um, risk in the second and third quarters as well. So do you think your gross margin was closer to, to flat with the positive pricing and purchasing that you had, if you were to back that out? Yes, I'd say we were closer to flat. Yeah, okay. Adam, maybe just, just to ch chime in a little bit with a couple of two cents on, on gross margin. And, and, look, Kristen hit this. I want to underscore a couple of points. I think what we're seeing since we, you know, we basically said, hey, for the year, 
we see ourselves flat to down 50 basis points since since last quarter two things right so one is we like what we're seeing on price execution and we like what we're seeing on the purchase cost side and the sourcing side i think that's a net positive i think what we are say, saying though is we do see the potential in the next quarter or two for more pronounced ppe headwinds based on the factors that Kristen described, you know, you got a big mask inventory, virus surging, no secret prices have come down on masks. So there is the potential for a more pronounced PPE headwind um, for the next quarter or two than we've seen in the last quarter or two, where there's been some that we've absorbed, but not as much as what we may face in the next quarter or two. I think for me, what, what I'd want to underscore, that what I'm looking at is saying, hey, the PPE stuff, we're talking about a once in a generation um, kind of episode here that's really hard to predict, was really hard to predict months ago, is really hard to predict now. Um, for me, again, site set on the three-year goals on the ROIC improvements, the real underlying value creation drivers for us are going to be price and cost. That's where we like what we're seeing. Gotcha. Thank you. The next question is from Steve Barger from KeyBank Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, just a couple of follow-ups. Just first, for the impairment, you said the ability to get the gloves is increasingly in question. Is that just based on how long it's been, or is there something more specific? And, and really, I'm trying to understand if we should be worried about inventory risk for other pandemic stuff uh, as cases hopefully slow down as 21 progresses. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve. So, look, th th this is a... I this was a really unique situation with, with nitrile gloves, and um, we followed not only a unique but a really difficult situation that is isolated to nitrile gloves in terms of a prepayment and an exposure of this size. You know, the, the accounting rules are pretty clear that when you reach a certain point of uncertainty and without going through all the details, you can imagine we're pursuing every path possible, but we reached a certain point of uncertainty. It was clear we, we, we impair the asset, which is a prepayment. What I'd say is... Um, we have used the prepayment tool many times over during this pandemic, and it's, been, it's become a fairly standard industry practice, actually through the pandemic, to secure scarce product. Um, it's worked out most of the times. This case, to date, it hasn't worked out. Um, what I would say, though, is in terms of prepayment exposure, if that's where you're going, no, we don't see um, another case like this. This is, this is, this is pretty unique. So truly a one-off, and you don't see inventory risk for other pandemic-related products? We, we Certainly, what I would say is we don't see any prepayment risk. I mean, I, you know, look, obviously, our, we, we, Kristen described, we're sitting on a lot of mask inventory. That'll be a function of how it moves. Is there risk there? Sure, of course, depending upon how the virus moves. Um, but, you know, th what we're talking about, the set of facts with the nitrile gloves with a prepayment, isolated to that. Got it. And of the 50 people added, uh, did you break out how many were metalworking specialists versus the, the hunters? And how long does it take a new metalworking specialist to reach the level of productivity you want versus that new salesperson? Um, so we did not. Steve, just for co competitive sensitivity, we don't break out specifically. What I can tell you is we gave you the three sort of primary buckets of the 50, which are the BD hunters, metalworking, government, as the three big areas of focus. Um, what, what I would say with metalworking is we generally find um, a faster ramp up because they are coming with industry expertise. Um, you know, the, the, the one caveat, mo in most cases when we're hiring a metalworking specialist, they don't necessarily have their own book of business. What they're doing is they're supporting. So the way we see the benefit in a metalworking specialist, number one, we're going to see it certainly in Milmax installations, but we'll then see a lift in, in, in their geography for our metalworking salespeople who are out there generating sales because of the technical expertise the individual uh, brings. And presumably that's a really fast ramp to get them up to speed on Milmax to get them in the door to hopefully leverage to other MRO products? There is a ramp on, there is a ramp on Milmax, and we've been super aggressive about rolling it out. There is a little bit of a ramp on Milmax. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not rocket science, but certainly it's a, new, it's a new trick, it's a new technology. And that's the case not just for a new person, but for all of our uh, metalworking experts. So Kristen's mentioning pockets of investment. It's certainly been one area of investment where we've been rolling out sample kits and testing tools and doing training for um, our metalworking folks at a pretty fast rate, and that's that's a piece of our investment, and we'll continue that. And and just to be clear, that that Milmax program is unique to you. Yes. 
That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Our last question comes from Patrick Bauman from J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, hi. Um, just uh, quickly, you talked about investments in SG&A of 15 million incrementally this year, and I forget what you said annually beyond this year. But um, my question is on capex expectations, and if you expect capex to go up over time as well as a result of the initiatives, um, and by how much? Yeah, so for this year, uh, CapEx, we're estimating the range of 70 to 80 million, which is a step up over our historical run rates. And in, in uh, the future years for the program in 22 and 23, I'd expect we're, we're seeing more of a sustained level over where we've been hyster uh, historically. Probably not as high as the top end of that range, but you're definitely going to see a, a sustained increase for the next three years. So that 70 to 80 is, is uh, going to be more of the sustained level then uh, for those years? Is that what you're saying? I'd say the lower end of the range, maybe think 60 to 70 for 22 and 23. But we're, you know, we're still working through a lot of the detailed planning on that. It's going to be dependent on how we prioritize different projects in the pipeline, what the specific investments are that we bring online at what time. But, you know, we can give you some clearer guidance on that as we get closer to 2020, as we get closer to 2022. Got it. And then, and then um, on the longer term kind of ROIC target, can you kind of remind us of the components of that? Like how much of that is um, sales versus margins? Um, and um, um, I, I guess the invested capital uh, side of the equation, are you assuming like, um, you know, changes in that, um, you know, by that time, whether with working capital investment or, or I guess maybe you're assuming you're using debt and equity as, as the denominator, so maybe buybacks, I don't know. I, I'm just trying to understand the components of, of that high teens number. Yeah, so we, we haven't broken that out specifically yet on uh, what kind of the, the, the drivers are, the components of getting to the high teens ROIC. I would say everything is on the table right now. We've been talking a lot, of course, about the growth and the operating expense side of things, where we see gross margins going. Um, but really, everything is on the table for us as far as opportunities go. And we did touch last call um, on uh, turning our sites more aggressively to looking at working capital opportunities. Um, and that's something that we'll be getting into uh, throughout 21. And just last one for me on, on the so, – Remind me of the gross margin dynamics annually through that time. Uh, what do you expect? Sure. So for the for the op margin framework for 21, uh, you can think flat to down 50 bips um, is is what is the guidance we've been giving. Um, and then for for the out years, we haven't commented you know specifically on what we expect to happen with margin, but we're seeing very strong price costs. We're investing heavily into pricing analytics. You know, not sure what the inflation dynamics are going to look like. That might be driving costs yet in 22 and 23, but. Um, you know, we'd be looking to, to cover that exposure and to continue to deliver strong realization. Is there still a mixed headwind, though, that you have to deal with over that time? I mean, that, that's been kind of the story the last – Yeah, you know, yeah. So there's, there's always – mix is the biggest unknown, right, and where we fall on those kind of ranges on gross margin. Right now you're hearing us talk a lot about the PPE pressure, which, as Eric mentioned, that's really specific to 21. It's kind of a unique situation given the – you know, the pandemic dynamic, but mix could remain um, a fluctuating uh, factor for where we land in that range in 22 and 23. But I'd say it's more about where the growth comes from in terms of the products where we're growing, um, the parts of the business where we're growing, and then how fast each of those five growth levers comes online. That could definitely influence the margin rates. Yeah, Pat, just Understood. to maybe add a little perspective on gross margin. So if you, if you think about our formula over time, what, what, you know, what, sort of what's gone on is what we've talked about is let's put th this year's a funky year with PPE and wild swings. XPPE, just the ordinary course of business, you know, somewhere between 30 and 50 bips has been where we fluctuated in mixed headwind. And, you know, so the assumption we've had and what we've seen for a while is if price costs are flat, then you're looking at, uh, you know, modest – gross margin erosion year, year on year. And, you know, that's sort of what the, the, the thinking has been. What, what, what I would tell you is this year in particular, what you're hearing from me and Kristen is we may have outsized uh, mixed headwinds specifically because of PPE. But looking beyond that, um, you know, we're, you're hearing us encouraged by our price realization and our execution there and the work happening on the sourcing side. And if those things continue and that momentum continues, it could create positive price, price cost spread 
which could eat into that mixed headwind and create a little bit different dynamic for us, a better one. So obviously to, to be determined and we're early, but, you know, on the price cost front, we're encouraged by momentum. Yep, yep, sounds good. Okay, uh, thanks for the call. I really appreciate it, and best of luck, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to John Corona for any closing remarks. Thank you, Jason. Uh, before we end the call today, a uh, quick reminder that our fiscal second quarter 2021 earnings date is now set for April, 20, uh, sorry, April 7th, 2021. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and please stay healthy and safe. Take care, everyone. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>